This is the story of two terrifying weeks in London, when a lone bomber held the city in the grip of terror. No one knew where he'd strike next, or why. Hundreds were maimed, three people were killed. The police manhunt faced an enormous challenge. Who, among London's millions, was behind the carnage? How could they nail the nail bomber, and save lives? This is the gripping story of their race against time. It's a story of high-tech surveillance and brilliant policing. And it begins in April 1999 in a busy London market. It started off all right that day, like it was, it was busy and all through the afternoon and it was coming up to packing up time, and everyone just wanted to get home. I was serving up customers fruit and veg, and when I got told that there was a bag underneath the stall, I had a look into it, and it was like a sandwich box with another little sandwich box on top, and it was sellotaped together, and in the top box it had a clock with wires going into the bottom box. And then it was going, clicking, like ticking, when I looked here, I thought, that's just like someone's made it up. It may have looked improbable, but the mystery package was now generating confusion and concern. A security guard come running into the, to the entrance of the store, and to me seemed to be running around in circles, shouting out, there's a bomb outside. It had been three years since London's last terrorist bomb. People's defences were down. I walked up to, to show a place from where it was, and uh, that's when it went off. It was a big bang, and windows on Iceland went psh, all shattering, and, and everyone screaming, and a big cloud of smoke just went up in the air, like, and it was really bad. Emergency services arrived on a scene more like Beirut than Brixton. When I looked down and, and I see the nail in my foot, I just pulled, I pulled the nail out and like, I, I hold it onto the nail in my hands and I was in shock then. I got hit with eight nails. I got one in my head here. I got one lodged under my arm here. I got one in my bottom. I got three down my legs and I got one at the end of my penis. Nine of the 49 victims needed surgery. They included a two-year-old boy with a nail lodged in his skull. Whoever had done this had intended to kill. Under Detective Chief Inspector Maureen Boyle, the Met Police's anti-terrorist branch, SO13, was put in immediate charge of the investigation. I was briefed that there'd been an explosion caused by a bomb in, in Brixton. It had gone off around about half past five uh, that evening, and that we knew that it was a bomb and that the damage had been extensive and many, many people had been injured. Most of the damage had been caused by, in actual fact, flying nails because the, the bomb had actually contained a significant number of nails. And they had actually exploded and fired almost like bullets, causing damage. Worryingly, there were more questions than answers. No warnings, no apparent motive. No claims of responsibility. And yet an attack perfectly calculated to breed terror. When this bomb exploded, we had absolutely no idea who could be responsible for it or indeed what motives. It wasn't what you would consider to be an actual target for potentially international or even Irish terrorism. So I was quite surprised, bewildered by what it could be. In the 30-year war against terror on London streets, there'd been nothing quite like this before. No calls, no claims, no suspects. For Maureen Boyle and her team, the bomber's silence sent worrying signals. It is unusual to have uh, no intelligence in relation to a bomb. Our experience very much based around Irish terrorism and had different factors involved. There was usually, uh, or often, a warning given by the IRA in relation to where a that a bomb had been planted. And if one bomb could be planted without warning, 
and so could a second. But when? Where? And who was doing this to London? The bomb in Brixton had ripped through a busy London market. No one had been killed, but the hundreds of nails had caused appalling injuries. An immediate police manhunt was launched, codename Operation Marathon. Well, we had no crime suspects. Uh, we were absolutely open-minded as to who could have been responsible and indeed the motivation. However, the style of the bomb and the location seemed to eliminate one potential set of suspects. What we were able to do uh, fairly early was to actually eliminate the, the Irish terrorism link. This was not a device that was in any way similar to the type of devices that Irish terrorism had used. With one obvious prime suspect ruled out, the manhunt turned to numerous terrifying alternatives. We considered uh, all different options as to what the motivation could be. It could have even been a local dispute between the, the market traders. We even considered a local dispute between drug dealers. Also at that time, the, the war in Kosovo uh, was very much at the front of the media and the news. It could have been related to that. But one theory made more sense than the many others. Well, I was talking to other crime journalists who were ringing around their own contacts. So we were talking and saying, what, are you, what feedback are you getting? People were saying, it's got to be a racial, racial attack. There's no other possible conclusion that you can draw. Jerry Gable, who monitors the UK's extreme right, also believed the bombing was racially motivated. Then our concern was to try and work out which group or which individual might be responsible for this. 36 hours after the explosion, the police were contacted. The caller claimed responsibility in the name of the extreme right group, Combat 18. But the call was a hoax. We just felt quite solidly that if the bombings were being carried out by people inside C-18, either of the factions, we would have heard something and we were hearing nothing. We had our people inside and we also turned some of their people and hardly anything was going on within that organisation that we weren't getting some prior knowledge of or knowledge immediately after the activity. Three days after the blast, and the police still hadn't made a breakthrough. Back at the crime scene, however, painstaking forensics was unearthing clues. Hidden amongst the shattered metal and glass, experts were pinpointing the chemical profile of the nail bomber. What we actually want to do is to recover all the component parts that actually came from the device to give us a better picture and to inform us as to what kind of device had been used and how that had been made up and also to give us the opportunity forensically of obtaining either fingerprints or DNA. The findings from the debris and, and the chemistry and um, the materials that were subsequently recovered um, identified it as being um, a relatively small, uh, unsophisticated explosive. It was different to the sort of explosives that have been largely seen in terrorist type incidents in the past, which tend to be with things like Semtex. It was uh, an inorganic explosive, the type of things that you would find in, say, fireworks. It was a start, but it still wasn't enough. There was no way from which you could attribute it to a particular group. The materials recovered hadn't been seen before and couldn't be linked into anything in the databases. You probably wouldn't need explosives expertise to produce the bomb, particularly if somebody were to be working from a recipe or a cookbook. Other clues had been found in Brixton. Now one of them would prove crucial. The bomb had arrived and been contained within a black sports holdall, which had the green writing of head on the side of the bag, and that indeed the bag had actually been placed beside the bus stop on the main Brixton Road, outside the Iceland store. But the bag had not been destroyed. After the bomber put it down, market traders had moved it, dumping it on top of some pallets beside the Iceland food store. Astonishingly, an unknown person had removed the contents 
not knowing it was a bomb, and then stolen the bag. After the blast, the police had recovered this key clue. It was clean of DNA or fingerprints, but the distinctive head bag would now prove vital. The fact that we recovered it, it actually gave us something to work on when it came to looking at the CCTV footage. It helped that Brixton had one of the UK's highest concentrations of CCTV cameras. Our initial priority was actually to gather all the CCTV footage from not only the immediate area, but the main intersections, public transport intersections within uh, the, the South East London area. Those videos actually contained in the region of 26,000 hours worth of viewing. So our officers actually had to look through all of that footage. On the Saturday afternoon, four, five o'clock in the afternoon at Brixton Market, it was very busy. And on the images that were recovered, all you could actually see was head and shoulders. So you couldn't physically see if someone was holding or carrying a bag by their side. So that made it very, very difficult. The images were also of poor quality. Most tapes had been reused for shop surveillance hundreds of times. They had to be viewed still by still to ensure that they actually could see with clarity what people were doing and what people were carrying. Meanwhile, the investigation was dogged by yet more bogus claims of responsibility. We had several calls from people purporting to be from extreme right-wing groups, uh, claiming association and indeed supporting the fact that the bomb had gone off. There was no intelligence or nothing to support that any of them were in actual fact responsible for the bomb. Six days after the blast, and the police still had no strong leads and no one plausible claiming responsibility. I actually thought they would catch whoever did it you know, very quickly. Only somebody who was almost you know, suicidally stupid would go out to one of those areas with all the activity, the police activity, community activity around it, would go again the following week and put down another bomb, I thought was very unlikely. I was wrong. Exactly one week after the bomb had exploded, a Saturday, the police staged a reconstruction in Brixton, hoping more witnesses might come forward. That same day, in London's East End, Brick Lane was quietly getting ready for its busy evening restaurant trade. Since the 1970s, it had become the centre of the UK's Bangladeshi community. We thought that we would be the last target, you know, that anybody should attack us. We mind our own business and we get, a, uh, get along with life. So we thought we are pretty safe in Bitlane. Mr. Ahmed had been working in his restaurant and at about 5.45 had left to collect his daughter from his wife. As she passed me, my daughter, over to me, that's when the uh, bomb went off. And, uh, the, 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 you know, it was a big, huge uh, noise, you know, deafening noise. The building shook, and I felt it was the end of the world. I thought it was an earthquake. So then I looked around and I saw a, a, the a boot of the car going in, uh, uh, up into the air with a black smoke and a ball of flame on the top. And then I realized it's a bomb. So I think it was all a miracle that God was smiling on us that day, that nobody got hurt. Amazingly, only six people needed treatment for minor injuries. An hour or two later, and Brick Lane would have been heaving with people. For Operation Marathon, it was a horrifying new development. I was absolutely shocked to hear that that second bomb had gone off because it confirmed what was mine and others' worst fears that this would happen again. We were fairly certain immediately that the Brick Lane bomb was indeed connected to the Brixton bomb. It, it was too much of a coincidence to have a bomb take place in another significantly uh, minority ethnic community. 
The police were now confident that the attacks were racially motivated. But once again, no warning. And once again, no claim of responsibility. Slowly they pieced together what had happened at Brick Lane. A witness had noticed a black hold door lying in the street. He put the heavy bag in the boot of his car whilst he walked to a police station to report it. Before he got there, the bomb had blown his car apart. It minimized the damage, uh, both to property and the injury to people, but it also actually contained the explosion within the boot of his car, which actually helped us recover the component parts of the bomb quite quickly. Forensics backed up initial suspicions. The same bomber or bombers were behind both blasts. And now there were more clues. The police submitted a, a fragment of a clock face, um, and there was uh, some typeface on that. And this piece of clock face bore type on it that indicated that the clock was uh, an Actim brand clock. Time was now literally of the essence. Two bombs, two Saturdays. It could happen again. But where? As detectives traced every shop that sold the trademark clock, the capital tried to adjust to the presence of a deadly serial bomber in its midst. We were extremely shocked and seriously, seriously worried when the Brick Lane bomb went off. We knew then that he'd up the ante. Brixton was not a one-off, it was a campaign. It was already, you know, the biggest news story around at the time. But suddenly, we thought, this is really, really serious. Two bombs on successive Saturdays. In both cases, London's ethnic communities appeared to be the target. A third attack now seemed inevitable. Throughout the city, the sense of alarm was mounting. After Brick Lane exploded, we then knew that this was going to be a series of bombings. And yes, the clock was going to be against us. We clearly anticipated that there could and, and was likely to be another bomb and potentially again the next Saturday, but we didn't know where. The two places I would have thought they were going was somewhere like Southall, uh, where crowded streets on the weekend, uh, very street, street life packed with that Asian people, um, or the Jewish community. With any number of potential targets, it was a nightmare situation for the police. But on day nine of the investigation, they finally got the breakthrough they so desperately needed. It took over a week for us to identify an image that we thought was potentially the, uh, the person that had planted the bomb. Officers had worked around the clock to review the thousands of hours of CCTV footage. They had tracked the movements of every person on the tapes carrying bags. Now, they had a suspect. We were actually able to identify the suspect arriving and walking in uh, Brixton Road, carrying the hold all. We were later able to track him walking away from the Electric Avenue Junction up the Brixton Road without any hold all at all. And that was what actually confirmed to us that this was the person who had planted the Brixton bomb. The image they'd isolated was little more than a blur. But it seemed to answer a critical question that SO13 had asked from day one. Were they looking for an organized group or a lone bomber? It was always a possibility from day one that it could have been a loner. But in a city with 12 million inhabitants, how would blurred CCTV images of a lone suspect bring the police closer to an arrest? I sent the tapes to other agencies within this country to see if they can enhance the image. We also sent the tape overseas to America to see if they can enhance it. The team were still trawling through the CCTV, trying to follow that initial image backwards in time. And when they identified some images that were actually clear enough for us to go forward and publish them within the media, we decided we would go public with the recognizable images uh, on that Thursday. They had a suspect, they had him on video, 
And of course, they wanted to get it out into the newspapers, they wanted to get it on television as fast as possible in the hope that somebody would recognize this man. The first pictures of the prime suspect for both the Brixton and Brick Lane bombings appeared in Thursday's Evening Standard. And I felt fairly confident that if we published some image that was recognizable, that the public would help us and identify that person. To respond to that, we set up a team of officers, experienced detectives, to answer the phones from the public when they were phoning in. Those detectives had a list of questions that they would ask all the, the people who rang in, so that that enabled us to actually evaluate some of the information that we got. Two bombs, two successive Saturdays, and 48 hours to go till the next one. Would anyone recognize the man in the cap before the third Saturday came? That night, the calls started to come in, with everyone aware the bomber was likely to strike again soon. If I'm honest, um, I didn't fancy working on the Saturday, because I thought, you know, the two previous incidents had been on Saturdays. I thought I was fairly safe coming in from the overtime shift on the Friday. It had been quite an unusual day for me anyway. I'd already had a call to uh, London Zoo for one of the keepers that had been attacked by one of the elephants. 24 hours after releasing the picture, the anti-terrorist branch had been inundated by over 250 calls. And new information was still coming in. A call came into police through the hotline at about 5.25 p.m. This particular call gave us the name of David Copeland, who has been a potential suspect. as looking like the image that had been released from the Brixton bomb. David Copeland's name was now in the frame. As the police hastily followed that and other new leads, London carried on as normal. It was the beginning of a bank holiday, and so there were lots of people on the streets. The sun was shining, and there was almost a bit of a, uh, a carnival atmosphere, really. And so, uh, I mean, I was walking along with a bit of a spring in my step, I suppose, and um, thought I'll pop into the, um, the Admiral Duncan, uh, which is a pub that I had been into once or twice before. The Admiral Duncan is a popular gay pub in the heart of London's West End. So far, the bomber had appeared drawn to ethnic targets. There was no reason to expect an attack here. As Gary had a drink, the pub welcomed its early evening trade. Amongst them was John Light, who had travelled to London for a night out. He was there with his friends, Andrea, Nick and Julian. Andrea and Julian, for a time, had worked with John. They were all best friends, and he was taking them out to a show. His shout, as far as I can gather, because he was so delighted about being best man at the wedding earlier, and now um, being invited to be the godfather of Andrea's baby. As John celebrated with the happy couple, others in Soho got into the party mood. I can call the weekend, the sun's shining, make the most of it, get out there, have, have a meal, have a drink, go clubbing, and have a really nice day. I had probably taken about two, three sips out of it, and then bang. It's just like you're completely gone with the noise and everything around about you. But I just got thrown right against the wall at the back with the impact of the bomb. I could actually feel myself sliding down the wall. And the first thing that hit me was silence, complete and utter silence. And I thought somebody spiked my drink. That was my first, my first thought. And looking across where the bottles and glasses and the, the barman and, and things that should be was just black, just black and boards, that's all I remember, and wisps of smoke and two or one very bright light, which I later learned was an emergency light. And I wasn't aware of anybody being around me. It was, it was, very, it was a very strange, strange feeling. And so I turned to my right to, to see where everybody was or what had, what had happened. 
and I felt myself falling. That's it. That's, that's all I remember of that day. I, I thought I was dying. I just thought that was it, you know. I, the pain was so uh, tremendous in the legs. Uh, everywhere seemed to be like a knife getting pumped through your body. It took me about four minutes uh, on the motorbike to arrive in Old Compton Street. And I rode up on the bike to Dean Street. Um, and then right in front of me was, was the building. Um, the ground floor had just been completely devastated. Um, the whole front of the, the actual shop, or that's what I thought it was at the time, had been blown out. There's glass everywhere. You, you couldn't tell that it was a, a pub at all, really. Um, most of the chairs and tables had been literally blown apart. Uh, there was still a small fire at the back of the property. Inside, there were people lying about moaning. Um, some with partial amputation of the limbs, um, quite a few people with severe burns, and uh, there was an awful lot of nails. Uh, I mean, we're talking six-inch nails, so um, you could see them protruding out of people's arms, legs, faces, chests. I mean, it could have been a hardware store, to be honest, with the amount of nails that were there when that explosion went off. I was devastated because we'd, we'd released the images on, on the Thursday. We were actively following lots of information that had come through and we'd not succeeded in arresting him before he committed his next offence. My stock in trade is terrorism, murder, rape, robbery, all these dreadful events. That's what, that's what I deal with. But even I just couldn't take this in. You suddenly think, you know, a pub in the middle of Soho on a Friday afternoon. You're thinking, you know, what sort of person is doing this? Who the hell is this person? He's gone from blacks to Asians to gays. This bomb was the most horrific. In the confined bar, two people had been killed and many more were critically injured. Among them, John Light. My mum knew he was there in London and was fairly distraught to the point where she tried to phone him over and over again on the hour, every hour. And it wasn't until the next morning that it all became, you know, apparent that John was caught off in all this. What was meant to be a happy occasion for John and his three friends had ended in tragedy. Julian Dykes was also battling for his life. Andrea Dykes, who was four months pregnant, and Nick Moore had been killed instantly. The investigation was now a murder inquiry. The bomber had struck on a Friday, not a Saturday. He'd chosen Soho's gay community, not Southall's Asian community. The pressure on the police was mounting. We were responding to uh, the, the media appeal and indeed then second simultaneously, in actual fact, managing what was a new crime scene. And while many officers dealt with the carnage in Soho, others continued working on the new leads coming in. Among them, David Copeland. Copeland had been identified from the CCTV footage by a work colleague. At around 11.30 that Friday night, officers were sent to Hampshire to check out his last known address been out to several other addresses um, and just dealt with people who plainly weren't um, involved in the bombings at all. Originally we were sent down to Hampshire and this was just another bit of information. There were many other individuals that officers across England and indeed London were tasked to that evening uh, in relation to good likenesses to the image and indeed there was no intelligence even when the research was conducted that actually made David Copeland any more likely to be the suspect. But as the officers neared Farnborough, Copeland's name was swinging ever more into the frame. Scotland Yard were telling us that they were more excited with this intelligence. That hadn't happened before at the other addresses I'd, I'd been to. In fact, a cab driver had called the hotline saying he'd picked up the CCTV suspect at Waterloo, the mainline station serving Farnborough. 
we unanimously decided to go and cold call on the address to, uh, to see who David Copeland was. Everybody knew what needed to be done. Some of us approached the door, some officers went to the front, to the side, and as best they could, the back of the address, so it was um, surrounded in effect. And then for about the next 10 minutes, we started knocking on the doors, knocking on the windows. Eventually, the door opened. The officers were told that David was living there, and they headed up the stairs to his room. It was D.I. Bursnett who knocked on the door. There was a voice from, from within saying, who is it? So we said, yes, it's the police. What do you want? Uh, we want to speak to David Copeland. What about? And I, I said, if you open the door, I'll tell you. Um, and then there seemed to be a lapse in time before the door opened, and there was a bang, there was a knock of some sort from inside the room, and the door opened. And there, standing in front of us, was David Copeland. As soon as you saw him, there was no doubt that he was the man in, in that picture. The officers quickly stepped into the room. The first thing that stood out, there was a, a big German Nazi flag on the wall, and underneath it, uh, there was like a collage of, of pictures that were taken from uh, newspapers and magazines of the bombs that he'd done. Uh, there was a loaded crossbow in the corner of the room, um, one small single bed, it was quite a small room. There were some shelves, and that was where the container con containing uh, um, the explosives were. There were some boxes of fireworks underneath a bed. I arrested him straight away of, uh, um, as being involved in the bombings in Brick Lane, in Soho and in Brixton. Straight away he said, yes, they're all down to me. Three nail bombs in 13 days had traumatised the capital city. But just hours after the third bomb in Soho, the police had made an arrest. David Copeland had immediately confessed to the crimes. He appeared very nervous, he was, he was shaking. Um, we asked him some questions about whether there had been other explosives in the room. He said there was a tin of something, I think it was ammonium nitrate or something, so straight away we had a crime scene which had possible um, explosives in it. Copeland was put in a forensic suit and bundled into a car back to London. Meanwhile, his home address was searched for clues. Receipts for items used in the bombs and firework powder matching the explosive lab's findings were quickly discovered. The fact that he told us that he actually had some of the bomb making kit and, and the firework powder within his room actually corroborated the fact that he was responsible for these offences. In London, Maureen Boyle's team prepared to interview Copeland. What was crucial was to identify why he committed the offences and what his motivation was and to actually identify whether he had indeed acted alone or whether he had acted with other people or indeed with provocation. David Copeland was 22 years old, the middle son of an apparently ordinary family. He'd grown up in Farnborough, leaving school at 16 with only a few low-grade GCSEs. He drifted from job to job and for the previous two years had been working as an engineer's assistant on the Jubilee Line extension. Before his interview had even begun, the death toll from the Soho blast had risen. John Light had bravely hung on to life for almost 24 hours. His family had hurried from southwest England to be with him. After we had arrived, he died in front of us. It was as if, and I firmly believe, that he did hang on until he, he at least heard Mum or felt her presence. In the police interview room, Copeland was now talking. He started off as a joke, you know, I just laughed it off. Then after a period of time, I just, I just kept thinking about it. Because in the morning, before I went to bed, in the daytime, I just couldn't get it out of my head. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I woke up one morning, and they weren't thinking about it anymore. I was going to do it. My aim was political. It was to cause a racial war in this country. Right. So you would hope if I planted the bombs in Brixton and Brick Lane? There would be a backlash. From the ethnic communities. Why'd you put Neil's in? It makes it smash windows out, stick into people, own people, kill people. You can't pick this up, but whenever we, we speak to you about the gays, you have to close your eyes, and you seem to be quite intense out there. 
Yeah, I just don't like it. I just don't like it. Yeah. I've never dealt with uh, someone like Copeland before. I don't think many of us had dealt with someone like Copeland before. First of all, it's all your blacks, all your Asians, all your boys. And had you not have been caught, what would have happened next? Self. How do you feel about it now? I mean, a few days passed. You know I feel nothing now. I don't feel sadness or sorrow. I don't feel joy about the end of the world. I just had to do it. It's my destiny. After just four hours of interview, David Copeland was formally charged on the Sunday with the bombings. Even though there was evidence of links with right-wing groups, the police quickly went public with their view that Copeland had acted alone. From the examination um, of uh, the debris and the materials from David Copeland's home address, there was nothing to indicate that he was doing anything other than acting alone. David Copeland went on trial at the Old Bailey in June 2000, charged with three counts of causing explosions and three counts of murder. Many of his victims and their relatives attended the trial. I knew I was, why I was there. I needed to know that this guy was going to be put down and, and locked away so he couldn't do it to anybody else. But it was very emotional, it was very physically demanding. Copeland pleaded guilty to the charges of causing the explosions, but denied the charges of murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Whilst awaiting trial, he'd been moved from Belmarsh Prison to Broadmoor, a secure hospital. The question of Mr Copeland's responsibility was the nub of the trial, whether he was responsible for his actions or whether he was suffering from some form of mental illness which substantially impaired his mental responsibility and that would reduce murder to manslaughter. And I interviewed him on three occasions in February and March 2000 in order to assess his state of mind at the time of the bombings. There was no doubt in my mind that Mr Copeland had psychological problems going back a long way. Problems with size, dyslexia and anxiety had existed since childhood. But the major issue for the trial was more recent. Copeland was telling doctors that the voice of God had told him he'd been chosen to cause mayhem. But the important question was whether he could control these thoughts and fantasies, was whether he wanted to do it or whether he didn't want to but felt compelled to do so. In my opinion, he was not suffering from such psychotic symptoms. He did not try and resist it. He actively pursued it. And in particular importance was that the third bombing, took he brought it forward because he knew that the police were on to him and he was likely to be arrested. On Friday, June the 30th, 2000, David Copeland was found guilty of all charges and given six life sentences, one for each of the bombings and one for each of the murders. I think there was a sense of closure from our point of view. But I, I, I have a feeling that for many, it wasn't. But for us, it helped. Gary Reed and Tommy Douglas were also there to see the verdict. Both had suffered horrific injuries in the blast. Today's verdict proves he is a dangerous, pathetic nobody who is now where he belongs. Tommy lost both legs below the knee and had spent months in hospital asking why. How does it all come about? I asked myself so many times, you don't walk into Tesco's and pick up a bomb like a loaf of bread. So there's a lot of thought, a lot of preparation goes into these things. Gary lost his left leg at the hip. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, to me, it was just such a waste. Everything it was just such a waste of, of lives. People's lives were, were in ruins for nothing, and so I didn't feel like celebrating. David Copeland was a young man who festered a hatred for black, Asian, and other minority groups. And he planted the bombs with a purpose of killing people. He wanted people to associate him as being a mass murderer. I don't think uh, Copeland should ever be released. I don't think you can rehabilitate somebody who carries out bombings with that amount of devastation and um, destruction and death. So even when he's a very old man, I think he belongs behind bars and until he's 
carried out there in a coffin.